All right, this is uh, Philippians for Beginners, Maturing in Christ, lesson number one, this is an inter introductory lesson on this particular book. Before we actually get into the text, I want to give you a little background information on this particular letter. And speaking of letters, Paul's letters contain both content, you know, teaching and encouragement, rebuke, commands, and emotion. For example, in 2 Corinthians, he shows sorrow that the, the church questioned his sincerity. When he wrote to the Galatians, for example, he was surprised that the church had so quickly turned away from the true uh, gospel. And so the uh, epistle to the uh, Philippians is no different. Uh, it has content, instructions about spiritual maturity and what a mature Christian says and does. That's what this epistle is about. What does a mature Christian do or look like or say? But it also has emotion. Paul mentions the words joy or rejoice 17 times in this short epistle. So it's easy to find the emotional theme. Okay? So unlike other letters that he wrote in which he was responding to questions or problems being experienced by the various churches he planted, the Philippian letter was written and sent primarily in response to a gift that he had received for his support from this church. And um, uh, news about his and his co-workers' status in Rome and an encouragement to pursue a mature lifestyle. So he gets a gift, somebody arrives in Rome, brings him a gift, and uh, he uh, sends this letter back, basically is, is what this is about. So his, uh, his attitude, therefore, is that of a, a kind of a proud parent joyfully writing to an obedient and successful child with encouragement and instructions to keep growing. It's kind of an attaboy letter. You guys are doing great, though, he's saying. So let's talk a bit about Philippi, a really interesting uh, city. Uh, Philippi was located 10 miles inland from its harbor city. Uh, Neapolis, and located on a major Roman road, the Via Ignacia. Uh, it was named after Philip of Macedon, and Philip of Macedon was Alexander the Great's father. Now in 42 uh, BC, it was made into a Roman colony, and as such was intended to be a miniature version of the city of Rome. And so to this end, in 31 BC, Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire, transported a large number of Roman veterans to Philippi, and he granted it the just italicum status, which placed it on par with colonies located in Italy. In other words, you had advantages. If you were located in Italy, as a city, you had certain political advantages that cities in other countries didn't. And so uh, this city, which was not in Italy, it was in northern, you know, uh, where Greece is, up in the north, was given the same kind of uh, privileges as cities that were located in the country of, uh, of Italy. So this meant that this city was governed under Roman rather than local Hellenistic or Greek law. Every other city around it was governed by Greek law, but this city was, was governed by Roman law. People who were born in the city had automatic Roman citizenship, which as you know from other studies was very valuable. Uh, they had protection under Roman law and they were exempt from certain Roman taxes. They didn't have to pay land tax, and they didn't have to pay the poll tax, which was a tax on a person regardless of income or property. You, we think we're taxed a lot, you know, but the Romans, if you were breathing, you paid a tax. The only time you stopped paying that tax is when you died. And so the advantage of living in Philippi and being a, city, a citizen of that city is you paid neither land tax for your property and you didn't pay poll tax, the personal. So you, know, you, you got a leg up, you were really uh, it was really a, uh, an advantage to be there. 
so basically Philippi was a Roman character imposed over what was originally a Greek city. So it started as a Greek city, but the Romans imposed a Greek, uh, excuse me, a Roman character with Roman law, uh, Roman traditions you know, superimposed upon this city. The language spoken there was not Greek, it was Latin. Uh, it was ruled by two officials who were answerable to Rome and not, not any local Greek governors. Philippi was an island of Roman culture, Roman privilege and politics in a sea of Greek population, history and cities. Now its population at the time was estimated to be about 10 to 15,000 people. 40% of these were Roman citizens, 60% were Greek, the Greek mostly peasants and farmers, service providers and slaves. Religiously it was typical of the first century city full of various gods, various you know, pagan temples. In Acts chapter 16 verse 3 Luke mentions that Paul sought out a place of prayer where certain women were gathered. And the, this idea suggests that there were not enough you know, not enough uh, 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 Jews, if you wish, in the city, uh, because according to Jewish tradition, it, you required 10 Jewish men uh, to form a synagogue. If you didn't have 10 Jewish men in order to form a synagogue with women and children, you couldn't form a synagogue. So the fact that they looked and only found a group of women praying by the riverside means that the Jewish influence was not very strong in that city. They, they hadn't been able to put together 10 Jewish men in order to, you know, in order to uh, establish a synagogue. Uh, it was therefore in this kind of Roman Greek hybrid city that Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke journeyed in the year 49 to 50 AD. So uh, Paul gives no information concerning the establishment of the church at Philippi in this letter. He assumes whoever is reading the letter knows the history. He's, reading, he's, he's writing to the Philippians, so he knows that they know their history. He doesn't give a lot of information. If you want to find the information about how Philippi was established, you have to go to the book of Acts, where Luke's firsthand experience gives us a detailed account of how this church came to be uh, in the book of Acts. So let's turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. We have to go to Acts to learn about Philippi, okay? So let's go to Acts chapter 15 in verse 36 and we're going to review the story where Paul decides to return to the mission field for a second time. At this time Paul and Barnabas have returned to the church in Antioch for a time after their first missionary journey. So, in order to find out about how the church at Philippi was established, we need to go to the book of Acts because the story of that is in the book of Acts. And we pick up the story in Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas have just returned from their first missionary journey. They've reported to the church, they're taking a rest, so on and so forth, and now they decide it's time to go back into the, back into the mission field. So there's a dispute that takes place that we learn about. I'm not going to read this whole section here, but we'll read parts of it. So uh, after a time in Antioch, Paul proposes that he and Barnabas return to the mission field in order to strengthen the churches that they had planted on their first journey, which makes sense, good strategy. Barnabas and Paul have a disagreement at this point because Barnabas wants to bring his cousin, John Mark, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that Mark there, his full name, John Mark, that was Barnabas' cousin. Barnabas wants to bring his cousin with them. Now since John Mark had left them to return home before they had completed the first missionary journey, Paul was against this. So Barnabas wants to bring Mark. Paul says, no way, we brought that guy with us on the first journey and halfway through he bailed on us and he left and he went back to Jerusalem and left us, the two of us, to continue by ourselves. We're not going to bring him on the second journey. So isn't that a very human thing? You know, we read the Bible and we think, oh, hi, these men were you know, not walking on the earth, but they were walking on the ground. They had an argument over strategy. So they have a disagreement, the Bible says. 
Eventually the issue is settled as Paul chooses Silas to work with him and Barnabas takes his cousin John Mark under his wing and he returns to Cyprus, his original home. Remember, Cyprus was one of the first places that Paul and Barnabas and Mark went to on the first missionary journey because Barnabas was from that place. So what does he do? He gets his cousin, John Mark, the young guy, and he goes back to Cyprus to do more work among the churches that they had established there. And Paul with Silas, and the Bible says he was a prophet, meaning he was a teacher. Um, uh, they leave for the second missionary journey uh, together. Now, this is only speculation on my part, but it seems that Paul had, not, uh, had uh, outgrown the mentor relationship that he had with Barnabas. Remember, Barnabas was the older of the two, and at the beginning, it was Barnabas and Paul that were going out on the missionary journey, and Barnabas took the lead and he was teaching Paul. And then all of a sudden, somewhere uh, by the time they leave Cyprus, you know, uh, Paul was responsible for a miracle there. All of a sudden, the Bible, you know, Luke begins to refer to Paul and Barnabas. It starts Barnabas and Paul, and then it's Paul and Barnabas, meaning that Paul began to take the lead. So it seems to me that Paul had outgrown that mentor relationship that he had with Barnabas. Silas was a more suitable partner for him for him now. John Mark, on the other hand, still affected by his failure to keep up on the first journey, but willing to try again, he was in need of a good teacher. He was in need of a mentor. And I mentioned another little parenthetic, so much stuff in between the lines. In Acts 13, the spirit through the prophets, through the teachers said to the church, separate for me, you know, Paul and Barnabas for a, you know, a work that I had. In other words, separate these two, we want to send them out on a missionary journey. You notice that the Holy Spirit didn't say, separate for me, Paul, Barnabas, and Mark. He just said, Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas decided to bring Mark, and that didn't work out so well. So I'm just, you know, an argument for following carefully what the Spirit says, you know, an argument for following carefully what the Bible says, even in what we think are small matters. Anyways, John Mark, still affected by his failure to keep up on the first journey, but willing to try again, was in need of a good teacher. Well, Barnabas is a good teacher, he's a mentor. So he takes the young guy along with him to another work to train him. Now through God's providential care, this incident that threatened to break up one team of missionaries actually produced two teams. And we know that John Mark went on to serve both Paul and then Peter in later years. And then of course we know he ended up writing one of the gospels, you know, the gospel of Mark, that's this Mark, John Mark. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Timothy. Let's uh, uh, read um, chapter 15 verse 41 says, and he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and they were increasing in number daily. So we see that the objectives at the beginning were twofold. In other words, this, this second journey here that they're taking, they have two objectives with it. Number one, to read and explain the letter sent by the apostles concerning circumcision. Now, I need to explain that to you. In Antioch, there were some that were teaching uh, at that time, um, if you want to be a Christian, you, you have to first become a Jew. Their argument was, well, Judaism came first and then came Christianity. And so therefore, if you want to become a Christian, you first of all have to become a Jew. And if you have to become a Jew, especially if you're a Gentile, you need to be circumcised. 
So if somebody says, I want to become a Christian, you know, well fine, we'll circumcise you, you have to keep the Jewish law, and then we'll baptize you in order to become a Christian. That was the debate going on. And so Paul was against this. He said, no, 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 no. There's a, you don't have to become a Jew, that, that's done with. You know, to become a Christian, you have to believe in Jesus and be baptized. And so they have a big meeting in Jerusalem, the apostles, the elders, Paul, you know, and they debate this issue. And at the end of the debate, the apostles write a letter saying, you don't, basically, you don't have to be circumcised in order to become a Christian. And they give some other directives and encouragement. And they take that letter and they send it to the church in Antioch. And Paul, on his second missionary journey, takes that letter and brings it to the, hand, hand carries it to churches where he had established throughout the empire, okay? So that they could get this teaching as well, because this teaching had kind of creeped into the church at that time. So that was the number one objective. We'll go on the second missionary journey, we'll bring the letter, we'll read it you know, to all the churches that we planted, so we put that thing to bed that problem to bed, and at the same time, we'll encourage the churches to keep growing and giving them more, uh, more teaching. All right, so uh, for this second journey, they add Timothy to their number, who was probably given the tasks originally done by John Mark. He was a junior member. What, what do you think he was doing? Go for this, do that, organize the this, to, you know, write this letter, bring it over here. He was their assistant. Note that despite championing the right of Gentiles to become Christians without the obligation to be circumcised, Paul nevertheless circumcises Timothy. And that would seem like a contradiction. Wait a minute, you argued you don't have to be circumcised to become a Christian. How come you circumcised Timothy? Well, he circumcised Timothy because Timothy, Timothy's father was Greek. Okay? He was a Gentile, so therefore he wasn't circumcised. This was necessary not for Timothy to become a Christian, he was already a Christian, but it was required to enter synagogues where Paul preached since uncircumcised were not allowed entry. And it was known that Timothy's father was a Greek and therefore suspected that he had never been circumcised. You get the idea? It was for convenience sake, for com compromise. The, the place where Paul was originally preaching the gospel for the first time was inside of synagogues. He'd go from synagogue to synagogue to preach to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah and so on and so forth. Well, if he brought Timothy with him, who was well known in those parts, people were saying, wait a minute, he's bringing a Gentile. He's bringing an uncircumcised man into the synagogue, which you're not allowed. Well, that would be a distraction. So in circumcising him and making that a very public piece of knowledge, they wouldn't have that problem when they went from synagogue to synagogue. They wouldn't run into any resistance for Timothy to accompany them. All right, let's keep reading here. It says, they passed through the uh, Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Messiah, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to uh, Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So uh, notice how it quickly you know, smooths over the trip. <laughs> this is the trip that they took here. From their starting point in Antioch of Syria to Troas, their, their final destination, 785 miles. You don't see that in the text. They went here, they went there, they went here, they went there, let's move on. 785 miles covered. For those who are used to kilometers, 1220 kilometers. So Luke describes the trip in a few verses, but their overland route could have taken them several months. Now in those days, the Roman road system permitted fairly safe travel, and people like Paul walked 15 to 20 miles a day. They stayed in inns. They stayed in homes of friends. They stayed in synagogues. They, stayed, they camped outdoors when they couldn't find a place. It was pretty primitive stuff. Aside from their work in the churches, 
they established on the first trip, much of their journey was a failed attempt to go eastward. They wanted to go east, they wanted to go to Asia. He wanted to preach the gospel there. And the Bible says the Spirit preventing them, you know, prevented them to go east, that's all it says. So prevented them how? Well, it could mean a variety of setbacks or obstacles that prevented them from successfully preaching the gospel you know, in the east. Who knows, a washed out bridge. You know, maybe there was a main bridge to take them east and it was washed out, no way to get across the river or no available synagogues to preach in or to, to stay with. Perhaps somebody got ill. Perhaps they didn't have enough money. You know, one surefire way that God has to tell you that this ministry you're not doing anymore is by drying the money up. <laughs> you know, if you're all out about a certain ministry you're doing, you're believing in it, and you can't raise a single dime for it, it's not a bad idea that maybe now's not the time for that ministry, or maybe God wants you to do something else. I've always said, if God calls you to a ministry, he also provides for you everything you need to do it. And that goes from preaching the gospel to mowing the grass. If he calls you to a work, he'll, he'll give you the tools to do the work. And so this was their problem. It could also have been a message in a dream or in a vision, we don't know. Paul or Luke simply writes, the spirit prevented us. He doesn't say exactly how. Well, once they had headed east uh, and arrived at the uh, coastal city of Troas, at that point, Paul has a vision that finally provides the direction that they were seeking. The dream is general in nature, you know, come to Macedonia. No more details of who or where or how, but Paul's faith is strong enough to act based on this limited instruction. Again, this is how God works. We like to have, you know, uh, we like to have all the 10 steps. You know, God is telling me to do something, or I feel God is calling me to do something, and I, He's shown me step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, oh, good, I know the way. But sometimes He just shows you step one, and He doesn't show you step two or three or four. He shows you just step one, and step one. You know, you take step one, and by faith you believe that He'll provide step two, and then step three, and then step four. This is the way the Spirit. It works. It's the way it worked in his life and it's the way he works in our life as well. So in his vision, Paul saw a man of Macedonia calling out to him for help. So Paul and his companions, they set out from Troas and they head for the city of Philippi, which was a leading city in the Macedonian region. So this is why uh, you know, I talked to you about Philippi at the beginning of the uh, class, give you some background on Philippi. So once there, they seek out a place where the Jews might gather so they might find an opportunity to preach. So let's read about that. Sorry, there's Philippi. So he's in Troas, there's Philippi up there. Luke writes, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. An unusual thing, Lydia, she was a businesswoman, a seller of purple, um, uh, colored fabric in those days was very, very expensive. Only rich people had colored fabric. Only you know, people in politics, people who were very wealthy and influential uh, could afford to buy fabric that had any color in it. The, the ordinary people, they, they, they did not have colored fabric. So that she was a seller of purple meant that she was a seller of fine, you know, fine cloth and so on and so forth. Let's keep reading. He says, and when, she and when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So with these baptisms here, the church was established in Philippi. That's where it starts. Let's keep reading. It says, it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bondservants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. 
She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed. I like the way they use the word annoyed. <laughs> you know, they, they could have made it sound really nice and said he was perturbed. <laughs> he was vexed in his spirit. You know, he was annoyed, you know, like your, your four year old can't stop whining and crying and you're annoyed. Yeah, that, that kind of annoyed, okay? So Paul was greatly annoyed and he turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Oh, to have that power with our children. Wouldn't it be wonderful? But anyways, it says, uh, and it came out at that very moment. But when the, her master saw that their hope for profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. Remember I said in Philippi, they were Romans, right? Uh, the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with, uh, with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So in the following verses, Luke describes an incident that resembled what took place in Cyprus you know, during the first missionary journey. Remember in the first missionary journey, Paul struck blind a sorcerer who was trying to hinder his work. In Philippi, he casts out an evil spirit from a girl who had been following them about and drawing attention to their ministry. Paul, and here's some people say, well, why did he do that? I mean, you know, the girl was pointing to them and saying, hey, these guys are with the, with the high God, they've got the gospel. Well, Paul did not want a witness from a girl possessed of an evil spirit. That's why he did that. He didn't need a demon witnessing for the gospel, he didn't want one. So he quiets her by casting the demon out. And of course, this led to a riot stirred up by the girl's handlers who made a living using her occult skills. Nothing new there, right? Men using women for profit. Here is just a little bit of a twist. They're not using her, abusing her sexually for profit, but they're abusing her emotionally and spiritually for profit. So Paul and Silas are dragged before the judges, they're beaten, put into prison, and their feet are locked into uh, stocks. Now the only difference here was that their imprisonment was not caused by the Jews. Usually it's the Jews that caused this problem, but in this case it was, the, it was the Romans, the people in Philippi. So let's read a little more. Instead of you know, summarizing it for you, I, I think, I think Luke tells the good story here. He says, but at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. I want you to remember this little passage here. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all those who were in his house. Remember that line, okay, we're going to come back to it. It says, and he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Notice that the jailer had some knowledge of the faith because the earthquake and the fact that none of the prisoners escaped moves him to ask the same question that the crowd on Pentecost Sunday asked Peter. They asked him the same thing, men and brethren, what should we do? He's saying the same thing. Uh, well, what should I do to be saved? So Luke records only a summary of what Paul taught him, which in a few words was that faith in Christ would save him. But notice that the very first thing that the jailer does after confessing his faith is submit to baptism, just like the crowd at Pentecost. 
Now Luke doesn't mention Paul teaching the jailer and his household about baptism, but the fact that this is the very first thing he does after acknowledging his belief tells us that this is what he was taught. Remember I said pay attention to that verse there? That Paul taught him? What do you think he taught him? About the second coming of Jesus? You think that's what he taught him? You think he taught him about the, you know, all the prophecies in the Old Testament that, that, that were fulfilled in the new by Jesus? Because that would have been meaningless to this guy. He was a Gentile, he wasn't a Jew. No, of course not. It just says he taught him. And then, and then it says, and he and his household were baptized. Well, that was the response to the teaching. He taught him the same thing that we teach people today. Believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, be baptized. Nothing new. People try to you know, complicate this. It isn't complicated. It's the same cycle over and over and over again. So an interesting postscript here is that when the magistrates sought to release uh, them quietly, we won't read that part, I'll just summarize it. You know, the magistrates then come to the jail and they said, you know, you guys are good to go, you can, you can leave now, okay? Paul reminds them of his Roman citizenship. He tells the magistrate, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. You arrested us illegally, you beat us publicly, you put us into jail without a trial, and now you want us just to leave quietly? Uh-uh. No, 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 you're going to have to come to the jail in broad daylight and you will have to release us publicly. Why? Well, because Paul did not want to be accused in the future that he was a runaway, that he had escaped. Oh, there was an earthquake and he escaped and they would have a reason to hunt him down and to arrest him. That's number one. And number two, the magistrates, remember I told you Philippi was like a mini Rome in the middle of a Greek culture. Well, being a, you were not allowed to beat a Roman citizen publicly without a trial. You were not allowed to put a Roman citizen in jail. I mean, it was a high privilege to be a Roman citizen and they had done this to them illegally. And so Paul had them over a barrel and uh, we, we understand uh, that they eventually uh, came and uh, very meekly asked them to leave. And so the judges release him publicly and legally. Remember that Philippi is in Macedonia with a Greek history, but is now a Roman city under Roman law and jurisdiction. Paul pays a farewell visit to Lydia, his initial convert in her household, and then he makes his way to Thessalonica to preach the gospel there. So that's how uh, the Philippian church was first established. These, the, the, the jailer and these women, that's, that's the first, you know, the, ch the church plant, that's how it started, okay? So when we go back to study the letter, you'll understand you know, how this church was originally uh, begun. Uh, some more information as far as background of the letter. The author is Paul. There's little doubt that Paul the Apostle is the author of this letter since he names himself and his co-worker Timothy in the opening verse. Also, the early church spoke often of this letter with church leaders as far back as Clement, who lived 95 AD, and Ignatius, who lived 107 AD. They make mention of his letter in their own writings. So you have, you have leaders of the church historians of the church who lived at that time, who in their own writings mentioned Paul's letter to the Philippians that they had read it and they had circulated it. Very important because there were a lot of letters circulating that were fakes. There were a lot of letters you know, circulating at the time with the names of apostles attached to, to them, not written by apostles. But some guy would write a letter and then he'd put Peter's name, you know, Joe would write a letter and he, it wouldn't go anywhere if it, if it was the epistle of Joe. <laughs> but if it was the epistle of Peter, oh, that would get play. So making sure that the authorship was authentic, that it was an authentic apostle was very important, especially in the, in the early time of the church. So we know this is Paul, there's lots of historical uh, evidence. Uh, the occasion of its writing, as I uh, mentioned before, the traditional answer to this is that he was in prison in Rome at the time. We know that after two years of imprisonment at Herod's palace in Caesarea by the sea, uh, he had appealed to Caesar's court for a judgment on his case. Uh, 
uh, since both Roman governors, remember in the book of Acts, King Felix and King Festus, they refused to release him because they wanted to keep the favor of the Jewish leaders who hated Paul, wanted to kill him. They couldn't allow these guys to kill him, but they kept him in jail there to, to keep the Jewish leaders happy. So what does Paul do? Well, again, he's a Roman citizen. And because he's a Roman citizen, he says, you know what? I'm not waiting for a trial here because maybe these guys from Jerusalem are eventually going to show up and kill me anyways. I appeal to Caesar. Well, the, the moment that he appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen, that took the case out of the hands of the local governors and they had to transport him to Rome. And so we, we read in the book of Acts, his trip, he goes to Rome, he's in a Roman, not jail, he's, he's under house arrest. So he's under house arrest for two years while he's waiting for his trial. And while he's under house arrest, those two years, he receives guests and people come in and out and they bring him money to support himself and so on and so forth. It's during that two year period that he wrote this particular uh, letters. Uh, let's see, he was guarded only by one soldier, as I say, during that house arrest. He was free to receive visitors and those who came for teaching and training. Uh, this situation would then explain several references made in his letter to the Philippians. First of all, his influence for the gospel on the Praetorian Guard. We'll, he'll talk about that in, in Philippians. Who, 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 who is the Praetorian Guard? The Praetorian Guard were elite soldiers who served as personal bodyguards to the emperor or to high ranking government officials. So he talks about them in Philippians. Uh, it also explains the travel of both Timothy and Epaphrodites from Rome to Philippi to bring news. In other words, he had his helpers go back and forth. Now if he was in a typical jail, you know, he'd be in chains, but because he was under house arrest, people could visit him, he'd write letters and he'd send them off to this, uh, this place or that place. You know, he'd uh, continue doing his, uh, his ministry. Uh, and also it explains his gratitude for their financial help in the past. In other words, the Philippians had sent Paul money while he was in jail because he had to eat, he had to get clothes and you know, he had to take care of his uh, personal uh, needs. And then one last thing I want to mention here is the date. Uh, Paul is in Rome somewhere, again, between 60 and 62 AD. Okay. Awaiting his trial before Caesar, he seemed confident that he would be released and he looked forward to the continued ministry among them. Philippians was written during this time period and delivered by Epaphroditus, one of the helpers, who had originally brought the gift from the church to Paul in Rome. So Epaphroditus is in Philippi. They, they take a special collection of money. He takes that money. He travels to, to Rome. He brings the money to Paul so that Paul can take care of his needs. While Epaphroditus is in Rome, he falls ill. He was supposed to go back right away, but he gets deathly ill. He nearly dies, but he doesn't. He, 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 he's revived. He, and so Paul writes this letter to the Philippians and he even mentions Epaphroditus who was sick and he's a great servant and so on and so forth. And he gives this letter to Epaphroditus and he says, hey, take this back to the Philippians. This is my way of saying thank you and I want to encourage them and give them news of myself. Now there are other theories about the date and place of writing. Some people think he wrote it from Ephesus in 49 or Caesarea, but the 60 to 62 date uh, from Rome accommodates most of the additional information we have about the church and it is the conclusion of most scholars. I said one last thing but I was mistaken. This is the last thing, the outline. As I've said to you before you can, you know, you can outline stuff different ways but this is the basic outline because it follows the thought pattern maturing in Christ. That's what Philippians is about. What does a mature Christian look like, sound like? act like. So the greeting, Paul's prayer, Paul's condition, and then Paul's request, continue maturing in Christ, and he gives six examples of maturity in Christ, and then that is followed by closing remarks. So that's, this is the outline we're going to follow today. This lesson here is simply an introductory lesson, giving you some background information you know, so we can make sense of that. Uh, next time we get together, we're going to do uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So in your Bible reading, I suggest that you read all of Philippians, but at least verses 1 to 11, so you'll be familiar with that. All right, that's lesson one. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>